Welcome. Welcome to Tuesday, the last session in this room. I'm Mary. I am a director of software, or sorry, security program and product management at Salesforce. And I primarily focus on security tools for developers. So this includes static analysis, open source scanning, threat modeling. And this presentation is about open source scanning. So thank you for coming to learn about this. I've been in software security for about 11 years. Um, and that has covered developer security, services security, IT security, reactive security, incident response. And before that, I was an application engineer working at um, Intel, working on application codecs and multimedia graphics driver components. So thank you for, do you have a question? Or you're, oh, you're, you're summoning your friend. Excellent. <laughs> summon help. We should all summon help. All right. <coughs> Working. All right. So who remembers this attack, this malware attack? All right. So this happened about a year ago this time, and we were talking about. Uh, and who remembers how this attack vector worked? Okay. So now imagine yourself having to publish this blog post with your name on it representing your software, having to apologize for impacting 2.3 million users for malware. And more recent updates and studies about this malware has discovered that they had intended to even install additional functionality like key loggers. So it was only out for a month. It still impacted a bunch of people. And this, these are the type of things that we want to prevent going forward. So later on, this article comes out talking about how CC Cleaner was just one of several high profile software supply, uh, supply chain attacks that year. <clears throat> and, and why not? Instead of t sending a spear phishing mail to one person or a phishing mail to, you can impact tens, hundreds of companies with one component. This is how integrated our software development lifecycle is with all of the open source components that we use. And so it's easy to imagine having this type of attack and impact by just compromising one component. And then later on, this company talks about how this, this supply chain attack is getting more popular and will continue an upward trend across this industry. So, this was just one example of a supply chain attack, and it was um, primarily targeting software. But we also see supply chain attacks in network infrastructure, desktop applications, development software, operating systems. So why not services and apps? This white paper was published in July of this year, talking about the financial cost of cyber attacks. And it talked about four specific examples. What wasn't in the uh, white paper was the Experian breach. We're talking about a $4 billion devaluation in stock after they announced their breach, and, and an additional $400 million in immediate cleanup costs. So there's an actual financial cost for the type of impact that one of these components being breached can have. So we're going to level set. We're going to talk about the software supply chain and what it looks like today. So at the top, you see the, your traditional supply chain and how you get your toys to the retail market so that everyone ha is happy at Christmas time. What happens with software supply chain is very similar. You have lots of different components that come together. It's not only your applications, but also your network infrastructure and also what's running in your data centers and what software is running in your network switches. Like All of that relies on open source software. So you can only imagine, of all the components that connect, if you had to threat model this, what would it look like? And so what I want your primary takeaway to be is to ask questions in all of these things that can connect, these components that talk to each other, these services that depend on each other. How does it communicate? What does it communicate? Is it secure? Can someone man in the middle? Anything like that. Just keep asking questions. So this is a very high level overview of the software development lifecycle. And my goal is to convince you to integrate that with the security, secure development lifecycle so that it's a co-engineering effect of building on each other's knowledge, 
making each other's team stronger. And so we'll show throughout this presentation how we're covering more of this life cycle so that we can have better coverage. So why are you here? All right, so show of hands, who is more of an Astro the Administrator type of persona? And then show of hands, who's more of a developer? Okay, cool, good. <clears throat> So I wanted to say from the infrastructure side, there's a ton of open source in our data centers. We have DNS, Find, MongoDB, PostgreSQL, like all of these are open source components that all of us depend on. And because of the way infrastructure is developed, extremely difficult to update. Like it's very time consuming and problematic. Same thing for developers. Nowadays, like 80 to 90% of applications are open source components. So that means a lot of the code that you build is glue that connects these things, but you also are taking on the security and legal risk of these other components that you may know very little about. So when you are talking about these third party components, these open source components, what are you, what are you going to be doing to verify and confirm that they stay up to date, that they meet your, your security bar, your legal bar, and this, talk, we'll talk about how you can do that. All right, so we talked earlier about how the stock value can be hit, the customer can be hit. Like this is all um, the open source components that we see in data centers and network infrastructure. And we also talked about the security attack risk and the legal risk. See, these are, you know, sometimes you don't think about the legal risk, but these are things that we as companies have an obligation to report to customers. And so the goal here is to reduce the security and legal risk of, of the third party components and open source components that we use so that we can improve the security posture of our products. So let's crack open the package. When you're talking about food, like you might care about whether your food is organic or if it's grass fed or where it comes from or whether it's ethically sourced. And when you're talking about cars, I'm a car aficionado, like I do care about the size of the engine and how many revs it can do and um, additional suspension. So I do ask, like how does this engine work in order for me to help people how to teach them how to drive? Right? And when you look at the house or condo or wherever you live, like all of the components, like your water heater, your roof, they all have a lifespan. And yet when we take, talk about open source components, we don't necessarily think, oh, I should look at this every three months or every year or... So when you build your components, when is really the last time you looked at them? Like, are they the same since you incorporated them years ago? And I could see on some faces, some, some looks of uh, maybe being caught that way. So the tricky part is that you may not even know what is underneath, and that's why it takes partnership with your operations teams, with your lease teams, and with your legal teams to figure out what is really the infrastructure that you are building on. And when you were talking about open source components in your build, then perhaps even your best case scenario is your build can't access your network share or a repository on component and you, you might break a build because that component is temporarily missing. But worst case, you could be shipping malware to 2.3 million customers. The tricky part here is that because you're relying on so many different components and they're outside of your realm and outside of your control, you do have to work with coordinated vulnerability disclosure to get these things fixed. And so if someone external reports it and it impacts you, you report it to the open source component library and maybe that person has some free time to fix this and maybe, and more likely they don't. If you don't opt uh, update often enough, you will get caught having to choose between a major version upgrade or a minor version upgrade. And that just impacts the likelihood of having breaking API changes. Like going from 2.3 to 2.4 is not a big deal, but going from two to three to even 
whatever is even more, right? So you will definitely be breaking functionality and causing a bigger customer impact if you change and update more infrequently. Oh, and the last part there is, <clears throat> say you're taking the task, you're, taking, you're doing the good thing of updating your components, but you could be updating your components from a place that isn't trustworthy. So this is where you have a mirror with, within, you're, you're actually doing an additional scan of the components that you get from Maven or from NPM or PyPy, and you take, the extra step of mirroring them, scanning them yourself, verifying them yourself before you integrate it into your build. You take an extra risk if you pull them directly from the wild, wild west, right? So it's always this balance. I had a picture of Lady Liberty or Lady Justice here with the scales, but you have to balance all of these together. Like your primary job probably isn't security. You're trying to get new features out the door. You're shortening your time to market. You're trying to make sure your servers are up and running for all the holiday shopping and everything that's coming up next. And yet you also have to make sure that people's credit cards don't get compromised and your services don't go down with a denial of service attack. So we are all aware that this is a very fine balancing act. Maybe another picture might have been someone on a high wire and something we might feel like we're stretched thin. But we're, we're here to in, impact the the awareness of the third party software and open source software that we use in our apps. There's a couple different ways that we can fix the problem. And the first part is this very time consuming, tedious way of doing manual reviews. And so it used to be that every team that had to get uh, had to get pre-approval in order to use an open source component. And we even use text like, oh, make sure you have a backup plan in case this component doesn't get used. So it becomes this sort of, um, it kind of reduces your agility when you have to do these extra sort of steps. And additionally, because the legal case can differ, just because one team has it approved doesn't mean another team can approve because one team might have modified it or distributed it. So it just gets super complicated. And then you can do what security teams or development teams do. They just check the Wild West, the internet, to see, am I on the latest version? Which of the many latest versions should we be using? Should, can I use the latest minor version? Do I have to update to the latest major version? Right? So you can look at your change logs. You can look at the code that changed and try to figure out what has changed and if that impacts the code that you are using. And then finally, we have to include legal in this all this as well, because some licenses are okay for internal use, some licenses are okay for external use, but sometimes there's a new license that comes up, and so there is a required process of bringing your legal team to make sure that they are aware of the, new, of the different licenses that are being used, and if that's okay for use inside commercial software. So we're gonna move on to the bright, shiny future. And so one thing I really like about my EVP is he's not just about crawling, walking, or running. He's very aware that there's a slithering stage of like what is really out there? What does our environment really look like? And so one thing I asked earlier was, are you administrator or a developer? And this track targets both. But both of those personas bring open source components into the environment. Like you are bringing in these different things that run in the data centers, your networks, and your applications. And you are also the ones that, are that should be integrating these into the design reviews of your network, infrastructure, data centers, and applications. These components are just as important as the code that you write. Don't forget about the legal risk. There's potentially Lots of money at stake if you happen to include the wrong uh, component with the wrong license. And then you have to think about what happens with your workflow when you decide to use these components. So does it have an owner? Best case scenario, yes, and you can update it. And keep in mind, these are all best case scenarios. I, I was reading lots of white papers preparing for this, and they said, more than 80% of open source doesn't have open source, uh, doesn't have an owner. So then, 
Do you want to own it? You know, so <laughs> you, the reason why you were using these open source components was to improve your agility, and now if it doesn't have an owner, do you want to take that on? Maybe if you find it super useful and you really like the quality of the code, maybe it might be worthwhile. But if you don't, maybe you want to replace it. Maybe there's another library out there that can offer similar functionality that does have a better adoption rate and use case in the, in the audience, right? Or maybe you don't need that component at all anymore. Maybe you can write it yourself. Maybe there's a thousand APIs in the library. You only need three methods. You can remove it. So these are all the questions you get to answer for each component. So if you're anything like most companies, it's probably going to be hundreds, thousands of components. So now we're going to get to crawling. Right, so now we're, we're climbing out. And one of the first things we did was look at source code repos. So we're looking at our GitHub Enterprise instances and using uh, our command line integration in order to figure out how to uh, scan and look for issues that we should have known about. And so we were able to use Sonotype Nexus IQ server. It was able to have REST APIs that would easily retrieve information about vulnerabilities, workarounds, recommendations. All of this stuff has been amazingly useful to give straight to a developer to pinpoint here's where the problem is, here's how an attacker could exploit it, here's what version you should upgrade to. So that level of detail is really helpful instead of having this back and forth conversation of, which of these thousands of components do I need to upgrade? And then for the people in the Salesforce ecosystem, there's, there are free tools out there, such as this one. So you don't necessarily have to use the most expensive tool or the cheapest tool. There's some somewhere in the middle that will best fit your particular build environment and your ecosystem. So we're going back to this supply chain image that we started with. Now we can see we're covering this one phase, and so we can sleep a little better that we're covering all of this in this part of the, of the supply chain. And we, we, when we look at the software development-like cycle, we're looking at this part in the middle. So we're thinking about where we have included third-party libraries and open source libraries, and we're able to scan and detect at this point. So now we're walking. We're climbing out. And at this point, the next best thing that you could do is integrate with build. So you can choose to search for all of this stuff every time you build, and even warn or even block build if you get to that maturity level. So there's a lot of different integration levels that, that can be offered in order to help catch these, scan these, you know, and figure out where you can um, add more automation. And if you want to look at other options, there's Sneak and Greenkeeper. Sneak is helpful because you click a button and it actually generates a pull request to update your library. And depending on the ecosystem that you're in, um, compliance regulations might not let you update without doing strenuous testing. But if it is more lax, it's super easy, right? And Green Greenkeeper offers similar functionality there as well. <clears throat> so now we're covering half of this life cycle and we're moving into covering more of the software development life cycle as well. So now we're going to start running. Now we're going to cover at the developer level, even before they start integrating, even before they start writing any code to import those, you can use Nexus Firewall with Nexus Repository so that when you store your libraries in Nexus Repository, Firewall will scan for security and legal issues even before a developer starts. So this is where you can save a lot of time. It does require more integration. It does require reaching out to more of your team and build and it, so it can be more complicated, but the impact is a lot bigger. You do want to shift as left as possible because the further right, you're going to end up slowing down release, you're going to be blocking build. You know, if you can, slow, if you can notify developers earlier, you will all win. There are plugins that also do this well. So if you can't integrate at the repository level, you can also integrate at the IDE level. So there are lots of different options. 
And there are even more that you can choose from. Oops, there's a typo there, but we're going <clears> to. <throat> all right, so now we're covering all of the supply chain. We're going all the way from source to build to deployed systems, and we're able to check and warn and and potentially even block at those different points. And the same thing here, where blue is fun and peaceful and you want to like sleep better at night and not get called into incidents, like this is where you wanna have your fun work-life balance. So here's the impact to security and legal reviews. So as an example, we had 800 jars that we needed to scan and something that would have been completely daunting to do manually, all right? This took me probably less than 15 minutes on a Saturday. And it's just like, okay, let's see what's, and I expected it to run all weekend and it, I didn't need to do that at all. So it's super fast. <clears throat> you have a much more comprehensive view of your security risk. You have improved awareness of the security posture due to your open source. And when you do continuous scanning, you can incorporate this into not only development, but also build and deployment. And then once you add all of that, you can also uh, include it at intake time as well. And then finally you have a single list of all your legal risk as well. So this helps not only the security teams, but also the legal teams. You're never gonna survive, you're never gonna scale, you're never gonna expand or increase your coverage or reduce time to market, like you have to automate. And so this is why finding the right automation for your dev team, for your build team, for your release team, for your intake team, there's, there are lots of different options out there. Feel free to evaluate all of them. This is not a thou shalt use this tool, but take the time to look at your ecosystem, figure out what is useful, what your goals are, what time frame you have, and figure out the best solutions for all of those. All right, this is one of my favorite quotes because this is why I was asking at the beginning, like all of you should be asking questions. You should be passionately curious, ask more questions, like why are we doing it this way? When are we gonna figure out the security and legal risk of our open source components? Ask questions. So you'll have been here at Dreamforce for a week by the time you get home, All right? And you're gonna drop off your bags, you're gonna figure out, oh, I'm really hungry, all I've been doing is eating airport food all week, and you open the fridge. And at this point you might say, oh, the food's been in here for a week, maybe I should toss it out. There's one saying that, that applications don't age like wine, they age like milk. And so you do have to make sure that the, the, the components you're consuming are not curdled, right? <clears throat> and if you're like me, you know, I will, I will have been away a week and I'll have to go home and clean out the cat box. And for the car, like I've been putting off changing my oil, like these are all the things that you should be maintaining. Software needs maintenance, just like your house, your car, and, and figuring out what even is in the ingredients of your food. So here's a couple steps that we could do. Verifying the integrity of your supply chain. Like this, figure out if you're using Docker containers. Look at your App Exchange apps. Figure out how all of that is being deployed. Read about how these software supply chain attacks can work. Ask more questions about the components, how they interact, when they interact, what data they store, when do they store it. And honestly, you are the ones that brought in these components into the ecosystem. You are the ones to best figure out, is this thing behaving differently than I expect? So ask questions. Figure out the risk profile of the components and examine different automation options because there are ways to integrate with Yum and with Docker and all these other different deployment technologies out there. And then for developers, like. That cool JavaScript library that you added five years ago probably has cross-site scripting bugs in it. And I mean, I look at jQuery output and libraries and I look at Jetty and all of those things, like it's, it's only the latest version that doesn't have it. And it's only that way because it's been alive for a short period of time. So there are lots of white papers out there that talk about the number of vulnerabilities for the age of the components that you're using. And so it's really important to figure out 
maybe we should examine these on a regular basis. Maybe we should do this in every release. Maybe we should do it in every sprint. Figure out what the software uh, security risk profile looks like for these different components. And when you're writing the glue that combines all these together, like there is a bunch of, uh, the glue that integrates all the modules could also have vulnerabilities. So figure out not only in your libraries, but also the code that you're writing as well. And so it's one thing to verify patches, and it's another thing to patch ex expeditely. Like, you unfortunately need to do both. So maybe you, you might have to do a checksum. Maybe you should do hashing of the, the components you download. Maybe you should pay attention to where those updates are coming from. Yeah, so I would say pushing off updating your open source components is like pushing off your car maintenance. Like, at some point, the oil in your car will degrade and will no longer provide any value to the in internal engine components. And when you do that, you have a $10,000 repair versus a $100 oil change. Say, so the purpose of using open source components is to increase agility, but don't take shortcuts by never looking at them again. Complete your due diligence and figure out if you should be continuing to use that particular version? Or should you really be using every version of that open source library? It's fine to figure out what works with your ecosystem by trying things out manually. The next key part is to automate because there's no way to keep up with the demand and time to market requirements that all these companies and all of your companies are required to have. And the other thing, the last thing is one of the themes for Dreamforce this year is sustainability. I also want you to think about the sustainability of your software. Like think about the components that are you that are that you are using, that you are taking dependencies on, and you are accumulating security and legal risk for those. Questions? The question was, what do you think is the hardest thing that is getting started on this is? I have talked with the vendor that we use for open source scanning, and he was really impressed with how we found this really important. And so sometimes the most important thing might be to convince your team, your security teams, your development teams, your management, that this is an actual risk. And this is why one of the things I talked about was the financial impact of using these components and the brand impact and your customer impact. Like these are all measurable things that you can give to, in order to figure out, here's why we need to start tackling this problem. And a lot of people might think, oh, it's working, let's leave it. But if it's like food, if it's like your car, if it's like your house, like they all age, they all have a lifespan. And if they don't have owners, you become that owner and you have to take on the risk because it's in your software targeting your customers. So, other questions? Cool, last session of the day in this room. Don't forget to check out all of these other security talks. I've highlighted one for Thursday called Secret Storage on the Salesforce platform. This is another topic near and dear to my heart. Uh, so go find out what it's like to secure your secrets, passwords, credentials when you're using the Salesforce platform on those days. There's a bunch of other interesting information. If you have any questions about any of these topics, feel free to come up. Thank you so much.